Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Lynn Fries in Geneva. This is part four of a six-part series with economist Hajun Chang. We're looking into thoughts from his book, Economics, The User's Guide, where he writes that of nine major schools of economic thought, no one of them explains everything. In this segment, we look into how many different schools of economic thought each have something to contribute. Our guest, Hajun Chang, joins us from the UK, where he teaches economics at the University of Cambridge. Economics, the User's Guide is his latest book. Earlier books include Kicking Away the Ladder and 23 Things They Don't Tell You About Capitalism. Welcome, Hajun. Hi. I'd like to ask you to tell us what's wrong with the view that one approach, the neoclassical approach, is the right way of doing economics. In other words, what contributions from other major schools of economics show how they've differentiated themselves from the neoclassical approach? Take them one by one, one contribution each. Let's start with the Marxist school. Yeah. Well, I would say that one distinguishing feature of uh, Marxist economics is that uh, it uh, has a more holistic uh, view of uh, human beings and society. So, I mean, uh, I already mentioned uh, the importance of work in uh, Marxist economics because uh, you know, in Marxist economics that uh, people are not just consumers, uh, that they're also producers. And what happens in the workplace, uh, whether they are subject to boring work or the difficult work or rewarding uh, work, uh, interesting work, I mean, that uh, is a huge uh, element in the determination of uh, human well-being. So, that kind of a uh, different perspective on uh, who we are or what human beings are uh, really uh, makes uh, Marxism uh, quite different uh, from neoclassical economics. And the Austrian school? Now, Austrians are even more pro-market than the neoclassical economists. And uh, they're often in the, the same political camp as uh, most uh, neoclassical economists. I just said uh, most uh, neoclassical economists uh, because not all the neoclassical economists are in favor of uh, free market. Uh, just think uh, about people like Paul Krugman and uh, Joe Stiglitz, because uh, neoclassical economics uh, has this uh, theory called the theory of market failure, which actually can justify a wide range of government intervention. Insofar as uh, neoclassical economists uh, defend the free market, uh, their argument to simplify is uh, that people know what they are uh, doing and uh, the government should just uh, leave them alone. This is uh, that, uh, based on the assumption that people are totally rational and uh, they can take care of uh, themselves. Huh? However, the, the Austrians uh, defend the free market in a very different way. They do not believe that uh, human beings are the rational agents uh, like they are in neoclassical economics. Uh, they emphasize that uh, human beings have very limited rationality and the world is uh, very complex and uncertain, but then they go on to say that that's exactly why you cannot have uh, the government intervention because the world is so complex and uncertain, the government cannot possibly know what is uh, the better for other people in the same way that uh, no one really knows that, uh, what is better for anyone else. So uh, they uh, defend the free market in that kind of way, which I find uh, personally more convincing than uh, the neoclassical defense uh, based on a totally unrealistic assumptions of uh, what human beings are like. But uh, you know, the, this uh, the makes uh, the Austrian uh, defense of uh, free market a completely different thing. Of course, I mean, uh, they, they often politically work together with uh, the free market wing of uh, neoclassical uh, school so people often confuse that uh, they are the same, but uh, they actually have uh, very different theories. The institutionalist school? Now, neoclassical economics has virtually no institution in its uh, background. I mean, of course, uh, there's got to be some kind of uh, property rights uh, so that you, know, you at least know who owns what, and uh, you uh, have to, you know, protect uh, the market transactions from uh, fraud and uh, things like that. But other than that, uh, there is uh, the really no institution. It's uh, just abstract uh, law of uh, supply and demand. Institutionalist economists are saying that no, that's not enough uh, the, for understanding uh, what really goes on in the real world. You need to know what kind of rules are there, how different economic activities are structured, and uh, how the people's uh, behavior uh, 
constrained and uh, also encouraged uh, by certain uh, types of uh, the economic rules and uh, organization forms that uh, different economies have. And in that, uh, it is uh, the trying uh, to uh, understand the economy that, uh, you know, uh, more real world setting than as a the abstract uh, system uh, that is almost uh, equivalent to some kind of a system of uh, physical activities, uh, system of uh, physics. And the New Deal, was their shining moment? Yes, uh, the shining moment of uh, the institutional school, and uh, here I'm uh, talking about the uh, old, uh, so-called old institutional school uh, represented by Tosa and uh, Beblen and his uh, followers uh, like uh, of his uh, followers uh, like uh, Wesley Mitchell and so on. You know, the people often think uh, New Deal was a Keynesian uh, policy package, but this is uh, that. Uh, quite misleading. And of course, that, that, that some of Keynes' ideas were already there uh, in the uh, 1920s and 30s influencing policymakers. But uh, don't forget that Keynes' uh, the definitive work, uh, the so-called general theory, got published only in 1936. Hmm? The first New Deal was uh, 1933, and the second was uh, 1935. And when you actually look at the contents of uh, New Deal, I mean, there was a uh, all this uh, Keynesian uh, idea of uh, government uh, running deficits in order to uh, make up for the fall in demand uh, caused by the private sector financial crisis. But a lot of the rest of it was ideas uh, from the old institution in school. It was about uh, social welfare. It was about uh, trade unions. It was about uh, regulating monopolies. The developmentalist tradition? Yeah, the developmentalist uh, tradition, I, I call this uh, group of economists a uh, tradition rather than a school because it's a collection of uh, the somewhat separate uh, intellectual uh, groups united in the idea that uh, what uh, really distinguishes uh, poor countries from more advanced uh, countries is uh, the different abilities that they have in terms of using sophisticated technologies. Now, when I say that, a lot of uh, listeners might say, well, uh, what's the big deal about that? Uh, don't we all know that? But actually, in neoclassical theory, the assumption is made that there's only one the best practice technology, and every country can actually use it, only that you know, the poor countries have a lot of uh, labor and very little capital, and therefore they need to use uh, more labor intensive technologies and the uh, rich countries have uh, a lot of capital and uh, that, uh, relatively little labor. So they need to use uh, the more capital intensive technology. So in neoclassical economic theory, this uh, might sound quite strange, but if a country like Guatemala doesn't produce uh, things like BMWs, it's not because it cannot, but because it uh, shouldn't uh, given uh, that BMW the production uses uh, the very capital intensive technologies and Guatemala has the, the very little capital. So the developmentalist uh, school is saying actually what really distinguishes uh, the poor countries from rich countries is the different abilities to use uh, the advanced technologies and the governments of uh, relatively backward economies need to use uh, public policies like uh, trade protectionism and government subsidies to help uh, the national enterprises to accumulate the abilities to use uh, more advanced technologies. And as uh, some people may know, but uh, probably most people uh, don't know, this idea was uh, invented by an American and not just any American, an American uh, who is so famous that uh, everyone uh, knows what it looks like despite the fact that uh, he's been dead uh, for more than uh, 200 years, who is uh, Alexander Hamilton, the very first Treasury Secretary of the United States of America. So Hamilton uh, and, and uh, many of his uh, subsequent followers have developed uh, theories uh, that uh, question this uh, central assumption in neoclassical economics, is that uh, everyone can use the same technology and uh, have built uh, the, a whole uh, range of uh, theories 
questioning uh, that assumption and uh, giving very different uh, policy prescriptions. Let's do the other schools in the next segment. Please join us for part five of our conversation with Hajun Chang. Hajun Chang, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.